Hey folks, how's it going? So today see we're going to be going through a uh, system design for a nearby friend. So this is a Facebook feature. So how it works is that uh, given the user current location, so we're just going to list uh, their friends uh, based on their geographical uh, distance. So how you can think about it is that imagine you have a, you're logged in into like Facebook app. Then uh, if you access the nearby feature, so what it was going to do is that it's going to list all your friends who are close to you. So we can say this is this this is your friend, his name is Hector, and uh, the distance is zero, uh, 0 0.3 uh, miles, right? Maybe this is your second friend, maybe their distance is 1.3 miles. So just like that, this, this is like what we're trying to design today and how we're going to look at how this type of system are being scaled uh, based on uh, Alex Xu. Um, uh, test book. So now let's try to narrow down the scope through a uh, functional requirement as well as non functional requirement. So this is quite important because um, narrowing down the scope is going to help us to focus on like the important component that we should be considering. But before we do that, let's try by all means to remove ambiguity. By ambiguity, I'm talking about, for instance, the question says that we should find all the nearby friends for the current user. But what does the nearby mean? Like, right, so a nearby can, could be any, uh, any, any distance. So we need to come up with a number that we can work with. So in this case, we can assume that, you know what, five mile is the, the distance. Um, let's say from the current user uh, location, we only consider users who are within the five mile distance, right? So that's what a nearby is gonna mean to us. And this also brings us to the second question. Um, how are we going to determine like the distance, right? Are we going to calculate a straight line distance, right? So is it gonna be a straight line? Uh, what is it, straight line distance? Or are we going to say that uh, let's consider uh, miles radius, right? So let's consider miles radius. So it's more like a circle. So this is the things that we have to think about and think about which one is going to be efficient as we're going to be designing the system, right? The second question uh, we can talk about is that uh, how many users are actually going to be using the nearby friend, right? So given that facebook has like billions of users uh so we can assume that okay given they are one billion user we're only going to be considering the 10 percent um of them right we're only going to consider this is because we're assuming that uh not all the users are going to be um are going to be using their nearby uh, friend feature okay uh then we also going to make the assumptions that uh, the location history should be stored. So the location history. So by location history, what I'm talking about is that, you know, like the users are always moving. Like, let's say you move from one place to another. So are we supposed to keep your previous location? Are we going to store that? So yes, we can uh, store that, right? So that's something that we should consider. So the next thing that we're going to have to consider is the inactive uh, users. So the reason we're considering inactive users, imagine you have logged into Facebook into your nearby friend and you see a friend here and the, the, the system says that, oh, this friend is close to you, right? But this person has not logged in for a month, right? So the location that is the system is referring to is like their old location, like, right? Maybe they have moved out of the country or something like that. So uh, so this is not going to be, um, it's not going to be uh, reliable. So what we need to do is that we should say we're not going to uh, consider users who are inactive, right? Um, so inactive users are not going to be um, considered. I hope this makes sense because of uh, we need to uh, update the user's location. So we need like their current location so that the system can be reliable, right? So imagine if like, uh, Facebook told you that this is this person is close to you and Facebook is probably using like their old location so uh, and you thinking that oh this person is close to me but they are not right so that's why uh, we're just gonna make sure that we don't consider um, inactive users but now 
that we have handled some of the um, ambiguity. So let's come to the um, functional requirement, right? So these are the things that we're going to be focusing on, right? So we know that we need to uh, show the user the nearby friend, right? Um, but when we do this, we also need to make sure that we show them the distance, right? As well as we show them the timestamp. Um, when was this uh, distance updated, right? So this is the reason we need to show the timestamp is that the user knows that uh, maybe at this time, this was where their, their, their friend was. So this is gonna be quite important, right? So um, then we need to update. We also need to make sure that we update this, uh, this uh, nearby list, nearby friend list, right? Um, in like few seconds all the time um so that the system can be reliable okay then the non-functional requirement uh what are the things that we're going to consider so the first thing we want to talk about is low latency right so this is to say that we want to receive the location update from the friends without secondly the system should be uh, reliable so uh by reality by reliability, what I'm referring to is that the system should be able to maintain its functionality uh, and service despite if like there could be faults or errors or disruption, the system should still be, um, should maintain its functionality. And I know this might sound very confusing because on, on this functional requirement, I also told you that the system should be reliable. What I meant from a functional requirement perspective was that uh, the, 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 if like the system tells you that your, your, your friend is currently at this location, meaning that they are nearby you, um, you expect them to be there, right? So imagine if like the system is using like old, un, uh, un, unupdated location. So when you try to call your friend and say, hey, I, can I visit you? Are you there? Then the, the, your friend says, no, I'm not there. I've moved or something like that. You will be disappointed, right? So that's what I meant from like reliability from a functional perspective. From a non-functional perspective, what I meant is that there could be some faults, there could be some errors with the system, but the system should still maintain its functionality and we should be able to achieve that, right? So that's what I meant. I hope like I did not confuse you that much. And lastly, we're gonna have to make our system uh, to have eventual consistency. This is because we um we want to make it uh we want to uh, we're aiming for high availability. So that's why we're gonna have eventual consistency. So what this means uh, is that it's a, it's a trade off. I don't know if some of you guys know the cap theorem, but the idea is that um if like you have like um uh what is it uh high availability as well as partition tolerant, you will not get immediate consistency, meaning that the node where your data is stored will not have the same data because the data will have to be replicated, right? So the other nodes will have to be replicated. We're going to get into how this happens, but just know that um, this is a trade-off that we're making because if we want to make sure that we get high availability, right? Uh, and we're going to have partition tolerant. So for you to understand this, let me, let's make an example. Um, so let's make an example with YouTube. Can you see this image here? So you can see that this first person here said that uh, they are the first. They said first. And the second person here said that they are first. This is because, this is what we call eventual consistency. So when the first user opened their YouTube, they didn't see other comments. So they thought that they are first. And the other ones also did the same thing. They thought that they're first, right? That's because of data has not been replicated to other, has not been moved to other, um, other uh, 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 nodes. So that's why we call it eventual because it, it will happen. The data will go to other nodes as time goes by, but like not immediately. I hope that gives you a better um So now let's try to um, estimate the capacity of the system, right? So one thing that we said, we said, okay, we're going to be considering um, the users uh, who are within the five mile radius from the current user's location. So all the users who are within this distance will be considered, meaning this is what we call them uh, nearby friends. So we need to retain the list of all of these users. 
but these users are not static their current location is not static this it's dynamic meaning that they can go they can go to different places so they can get out of this uh, out of this um, five mile radius right so the question now becomes how often are we supposed to update the the location because of if you are here you want reliable uh, updates of the location right so how often, how frequent are we supposed to make those updates, right? So one can say we can make every 30 seconds, we can update the location, right? This is still reasonable considering that, okay, if the user is about to go, maybe by a walk, um, they can take average three to five miles per hour. Like if like a human is walking, but you can also consider if like they are going to uh go with a car or something like that but 30 seconds is is, is it's, a, it's a fair amount of uh of time right so we we know that okay we need to refresh this uh our system every 30 seconds right so this is going to be quite important when we have to now calculate the query per second uh metric right so before we calculate this we have to know certain facts so this is include like daily active users, right? And what is the number of concurrent users? So when we started, we made the assumptions that, okay, we have 1 billion users, right? So let's assume that 10% of these users, which is gonna be 100 million, it's going to be uh, the users who are using this nearby, uh, nearby uh, friend feature, right? And we're gonna make another assumption in that 10% of that nearby features are going to be concurrent users. So users who are accessing the system at the same time, simultaneously. So this is gonna be 10 million users, okay? So 10 million users are accessing our system simultaneously. So on average, a user, on average, let's assume that um, a user has um, 400, um, friends right and all of them all of these friends are using this nearby nearby friend feature right this is just an assumption and we can assume that uh, on the app uh, when the user access this app we have to retrieve 20 list uh, of friends right who are nearby so this is going to be a sorted by distance so the user can also uh, request more if they feel like 20 uh, list of uh, friends nearby is not enough. So this is more like pagination. This is how you can think about it, right? Anyway, uh, given all of this information, can we now compute the query per second, right? So we know that, okay, the concurrent number of users, like the users that are hitting our service, simultaneously is going to be 10 million of users, right? Then we're going to divide this by um this 30 seconds here yeah. so there's going to be 30 seconds so this is going to give us approximately around 300k um query per second so this is like the load that we should be able to handle so coming to the high level uh design of of the architecture at the heart of the design is that we know that the user want to receive a location update of their active friends on the nearby service, right? So they want to receive location updates. So because of the want to receive the location update, so this means that from the architectural perspective, we need to find all the active friends who should receive this update. So like, because we said that every second, or should I say every 30 seconds, we said that we're going to be refreshing um, the, the 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 location of the users right so which means that for each um location update so we just need to forward this location update to the relevant users right so we need to find all the active users um uh, who should receive this location update right but we also need to make sure that as we forward this location update to all the relevant users, we need to make sure that they are within a specific distance, right? So they are within a specific distance, like meaning that 
we will not send the update to the users who are not within the five mile uh, distance that we spoke about. But there is a cache with our current um, implementation, right? So because we're saying that, okay, for each user, we need to send updates to their nearby friends. And we said that each user has how many friends has 400 friends. And let's just assume, let's make an assumption that 10% of those friends are within this distance, right? 10% of those 400 friends are going to be within. So which means that for each user, we need to send the location update to 10% of 400, right? So now, given this, the question is, will our system be able to handle that? So let's do the calculation and try to understand. Because we said that, okay, essentially we have 10 million active users, right? Um, then we divided this 10 million by, I think it was 30, because we said that we make every 30 seconds, we make like the updates. This is because we wanted to get um, query per second metric, which was around 300K, right? So this is going to be 300K we're hitting our system every second we're hitting our system right so now take this 300k and you're gonna have to multiply it by 400 uh, by 10 percent of that 400 so this is going to give you something in the millions like i think 10 million or so so what does this mean it means that we have to send 10 million updates every second yes 10 million updates will be sent every second so this is huge every second like you can imagine we're sending 10 million update so this is going to be huge so given this we need to come up with an architecture that is going to be much more efficient than this so we're gonna to have to maintain uh two protocol right so given the mobile uh user so we're gonna have the web socket uh, which i'll explain what it is and we're gonna have a HTTP. Um, then we're gonna have a load balancer. So a load balancer is gonna sit in front of the, uh, it's gonna sit in front of the API servers, as well as the web, uh, web, web circuit servers. So the goal of the load balancer is just to distribute traffic uh, evenly across these uh, distributed servers, right? So we're gonna have API servers, so API servers, we're not going to get into it too much because of it's just going to be uh, doing simple things like user management, authentication, right? Which is not at the core of this system design. So the main important thing is going to be really uh, thinking about how we're going to be uh, sending these uh, location updates, right? So we're going to have here a WebSocket. Um, the web circuit server so just to kind of like explain the web circuit server you can think of it as like um it, it persists the connection between the server and the client so it has what we call the bi bi-directional communication so it allows both the server as well as the client to initiate the data transfer right so essentially the user can update the allocation and it's gonna go directly to the server as well as the server the user can receive the update from the server so you don't have to start a new connection like with HTTP. So the connection is always like open. Like that's why they say we persist the connection. So within this WebSocket, we're also going to have um, Redis. So it's going to be our cache, uh, location cache. So this is quite important because it helps us that we don't have to hit the database. So it's going to improve the latency for us so how we can think about this is that because we said that um uh within at each interval which we said is going to be 30 seconds we're going to be essentially um refreshing the location of the user right so uh you can imagine that we can actually cache uh the location of the user if like we haven't reached that interval yet so this is going to be what we call the time to live so we're going to have the time to live so for each like users our location we're going to have uh this thing called time to live so set on each um each record of the of the user's location so when the interval when the interval come and we we refresh the user's location 
uh, we're gonna remove this location like and we're gonna like add a new location from the user right so that's how it's gonna work and then the next thing that we're gonna have is gonna be the location uh, history database so we're gonna keep the location history database so so you can imagine that as the user move around like goes to different places their location will be captured inside this database then we're also going to have the user database because we said that the api server is going to be managing things like location uh, authentication i meant to say sorry um so we have to store the user information within here so the user can be able to say that i don't want this particular user to know about my location all of that information will be handled within this user database the next important component that we need is going to be the publisher and subscriber server so how you can think about the pub uh, sub server essentially is that the web socket is going to be pushing the user's uh, location updates right and there's going to push all of these location updates to the user's channel right then we're going to be having a web socket uh, of the all the active users is going to get triggered all the web socket connection handler is going to get triggered every time there's a there's a uh, there's a location update and it's going to take those update and send that uh, to the active users that okay your friend uh, this is the current location of your friend right so he's going to send it to those um, users and something that i said was that um, there's going to be a channel for each user and this is true because of redis pops up can be able to handle like millions of channels so uh this is the advantage of like using a system like redis pops up and please note that by subscribers so the subscribers will only be the users who are like friends uh to the uh the users whose uh, location is being updated within this channel right it's not like uh the 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 location update will be sent to all the users on like the platform of facebook no it's going to be only the, the 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 friends of that user right so those friends are going to be the friends who are actually going to be subscribers right so i don't know if you guys are familiar with like the publish and subscriber model um within this redis pops up right so that's what i wanted to say and another thing that i want to say is that there's going to be a function that get called to make sure that we don't send all the location updates to all the users, but make sure that we only send the location updates to only the users within uh, the specified distance, right? So this is quite important things that we should uh, take into consideration. So let's solidify our understanding with the architecture that we have. So one thing that we said was that we said that, okay, uh, at specific time interval, in this case, we said after 30 seconds, we need to send um, updates of the location if the user's location has changed so the mobile client right the mobile client is going to send the location update to the load balancer then the load balancer is going to update uh, is going to forward the location update to the persistent connection of the uh, on the web second client right what will the web socket uh, server do is that the first thing it's going to do is that it's going to save the location uh, within the history database right and then it will have to then update the user's location within like the radius location cache so uh, we're going to update uh, that and we're also going to have to refresh the time to live um, uh, within this radius location cache right the most important thing is that we all, the web socket what it will do it it will then um publish the update of the user's location uh within this pub sub redis right then this essentially is going to broadcast yes it's going to broadcast that um location update to all the users who have subscribed to this but the most important thing that we have to talk about also is that uh there's going to be um we're going to have to calculate the distance um from the user's current location update to all the their active friends so that we can be able to send only to the users who are within uh the distance right so this hope this gives you like a high level like it takes up i didn't talk about the api server because this is quite simple um it's just have to check like if the user has logged in 
um, it stores like the users like uh, information uh, and certain updates that they want to do. Maybe they don't want to use the nearby friend service. They want to disable it. Um, so this is what the API server essentially is going to be doing, right? So now let's try to consider the API design of the system, right? So this is going to be all the endpoints that we need to consider. So the first one is done. Okay, we know that we uh, we need to periodically, which is like I think at the after thirty seconds, we need to um, send like location updates, right? So how will the API design look like from here? So the request is gonna be we're gonna be sending the client um, coordinates. So by coordinates, I mean the latitude as well as the longitude as well as the timestamp, right? So the timestamp is gonna be quite important, okay? Um, because it shows um, when was the last time the location of the user was updated, right? So because of this, this is gonna be a web socket, so we not gonna get any response, right? So secondly, we need to consider when the client received the location update. So this is gonna be, a web socket so it's going to be data send right um so essentially the the web socket is going to send the friend location data okay so uh, i think this is going to be sorted based on the distance um so you can think on the ui you have um you have all your friends and it shows you how close you are to these friends okay Secondly, we have to consider um, the subscribe to a new user. So by this, what I'm saying is that essentially you want to subscribe to the user so that you can be able to receive their like location update. So we're going to have an endpoint to subscribe to a new friend. Right. So essentially what will happen here is that the request will be that you're going to send them the friend ID. Uh, then uh, you're going to get the response with uh, the friend um, location. So we're going to send like the latitude. So this is going to be the uh, coordinate as well as the timestamp. You can also... Uh, I'm not sure about this 100% because of um, for you to like subscribe to a friend, I think the friend has to agree first because since location is a sensitive uh, sensitive data. So I don't think that some people are comfortable like you knowing their location, uh, right? So that should also be taken into uh, consideration. So we can unsubscribe a friend, so we can have an endpoint to do that. So also here is going to be a request um, so the web socket is going to send the friend request, then nothing will happen, right? So it's just going to unsubscribe that friend. So there's nothing that will be returned. So this is all this web socket uh, stuff uh, that will be, we will be sending like information from the client to the server. And the connection obviously is always persisted. Uh, now let's look into like the HTTP um, request right so the http request is quite simple in that because it handle like tasks such as editing removing friends updating profiles authentication all of that so um we're not gonna get like into like the nitty-gritty of this we're just gonna say it handle authentication uh, removing friends adding friends and all of that so this is what all the api server is gonna do right so but the punchline is that I wanted to give you like some sort of like idea of like the communication that will be happening between the client and the server and you know what kind of API uh, we might actually think about when we design this, right? So now to, to really have a deep understanding of this architecture, let's talk about the data model, right? What kind of data are we going to be stored and how is the data going to be stored? On our Redis instance, uh, which is going to be the location cache, we're going to have the key as well as the value. So this is our Redis DB, and it's going to be storing the user ID, and the value is just going to be the latitude and the longitude as well as the timestamp. So 
we're using Redis to store the um, to cache the location because of Redis is super fast, especially if you want to do like operations such as read and write. So it's going to be able to handle that, and it's going to me it's going to reduce the latency of the application overall because of it's much easier to uh, get the um, the users uh, coordinates from the uh, from the in memory database than to actually read from the disk uh, database, right? So that's that. So the only thing that we're gonna have to consider with our Redis instance is that the Redis, the Redis instance can go down. So if it goes down, we could lose data. And this is like the trade-off that we're willing to take. So because of this data in a way, um, it's, it has what we call the time to live. So it's gonna get removed because of the user's uh, location uh, is always getting updated. So it's a trade-off that we're willing to take, right? So we know that every 30 seconds, we always get new like updates from all the active users, right? So if we lose this database, we can uh we can we can have another redis instance up and going and we're gonna stream the new updates into that new database right so that's like the advantage of this anyway we going to store also we said that we're going to be having the um, what is it was the location history database right so the location history database we said that it's just going to be storing the um the location of the user so how will the database looks like is that we're going to have the user id and we're going to have the latitude as well as the longitude as well as the timestamp so you can imagine that we have a lot of amount of users right and um we're making a lot of writes to the database right so which means that this is going to be a um write heavy right it's going to be a write heavy application because if you can imagine that uh every 30 seconds we have to like make the application updates so if the user's location has changed then we have to like write that into the location database so we're going to have to use something like cassandra uh th this is more like um these type of databases which are using the um, under the hood they're using the lsm tree uh, they're much more efficient when you want you, when you have something like write heavy uh, um, operations. So when you have like read uh, heavy operations, um, relational database tend to do well because they're using their B tree architecture in the in the background. So yeah, but that's like the the, the pretty much the schema that we're gonna be using to store like this uh, the location history. Um, so. The, the, the good thing about concern is that we can be able to shard this data across different like nodes so you can imagine that like all the data will be lying within like different nodes so that's an advantage of using this and we can shard this by the user id right so uh, the data for like specific user will be on like specific shard. So this might make it efficient if we like we want to retrieve like the user information because we don't have to read from all the nodes, but we can actually read from one single node, right? Now that we have covered the um, high level of the architecture, let's try to uh, deep dive into each component of the architecture and try to see how actually it's going to be able to scale. So the first thing we're going to look into is the client initialization. This is going to be quite important because it's going to help us to understand uh, the workflow of how everything will work from the WebSocket connection in initialization. So we're going to start with the client initialization uh, process. So the first thing that we said is that, okay, the mobile user is going to send us like their current location at specific interval. Then the WebSocket server, it's going to try to update their user's location in the location cache. So within this location cache, we're going to try to update that user's current location with what we just received, right? Then the second step is that we're going to try to load all the user's friend. So we're going to go to the user's database. So we're going to get all the user's uh, friend. So you can think of like we're receiving these ID from the user's friend. This is because if we want to receive this user's uh, current location so we're gonna go into back into the cache so that we can retrieve all the user's friend uh, current location the reason we're doing this is because we want to compute a distance um, 
the, the location distance. Remember that the goal here is just so that we can send the, the update of the user's current location. Now that we have retrieved the user's friend's location updates from the cache database, as well as computing the distance between the user and the friend's uh, current location, so what's left is that we just need to send the, the 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 user's information that we've computed the distance for to the mobile user's application like the web application but we just need to make sure that we only send uh, that information if the distance is within the search radius right so this is because of we want to ensure that like uh, the users are close to the current user's location right so the second last step is that for each uh, friend's user, what will happen is that the WebSocket server will subscribe to that friend uh, channel. Remember that we said that each user has a channel, right? So this is because we want to broadcast all their uh, current location to their friends, right? So because as part of the client initializ initialization step, we have to ensure that for each user friend, right? The server has to subscribe to the friend's channel in the Redis uh, pops up, right? So the last step is that we're going to ensure that also the, the current user's location will be sent to the user's uh, channel. So this is because of we want their current location to be broadcasted to the friends, right? I know this might sound too mouthy and might be sounding too confusing, but let me try to explain it in a much more easy way. So how you can think about this is that essentially we want uh, the, the current user, the current user to subscribe to their friend's uh, channel. The reason we want that is because whenever their friend, um, whenever their friend the current location changes, they will get notification because of that that change or that update will be broadcasted to them because they are subscribers right so you can think of like their friend they're gonna publish their current location at some point at some time interval and they're gonna get those changes and that's why we need to subscribe to them and we also need to send their location to their own channel the reason we send their changes to their own channel is because that change will be broadcasted to their friends. So their friends will also know that, oh, this guy's location changed. Uh, this is their current location, right? So that's how it is to this. So the reason we needed to walk through the client initialization step is because of I wanted you to understand how this uh, connection of the WebSocket uh, of WebSocket is maintained, right? When we the user like start a connection, right? How does it know uh, which friends it has to like connect to? So that's why we needed to talk about user database and cache DB. So I hope this gives you uh, some intuition of how the WebSocket initialization work. Coming to our second component, which is going to be the user's database. It is unlikely that all our users and the user profile as well as their friends will fit in a single database so we need to um shard this database based on the user's id so you can think of like we're gonna have like different set of data being stored on specific node so we shard based on like the user's id so this is a very common technique that we use to ensure that if like our data does not fit in a single database we can actually shard it and store it in like different nodes. So I think we're gonna shard based on the user's ID, right? I have to say this that given the scale at like in which like companies like Facebook uh, um, operate at, there's probably like an endpoint in which like specific services they can query like that service. Let's say like you have like the user service then you can create that service like let's say you want like uh the user's friend based on like the user id uh there's probably an api to do that but it doesn't really matter if like we create it directly from the user database or maybe we're using an endpoint but the punchline that i want you to understand is that how we're going to scale the service is that you can think we're going to have like different nodes and each node is going to hold different unique uh data set uh, related to the user's uh, information. 
So this is to ensure that all the information that we have can be stored uh, efficiently and it can be stored across like different nodes that we have like because if we only had one database then that information will not be able to fit in a single database given the number of users we currently have we're gonna apply the same technique to the cache database this is because remember that we said that we're making over like 300k updates um, a second so this is quite heavy for a single database to handle, right? Like 300K update for his. So it will be a good idea also here to shard based on the user's ID. So you can think like we're gonna store like uh, specific location updates on like specific nodes. This is basically, this is slowly based on like the user's ID. Um, so this is how we're gonna do it, right? So just to also increase, um, uh, just to avoid um, like the the system going down, we can also add a replication strategy in which we're going to replicate these nodes data on like um, the secondary server, something like that, right? So that if this goes down, then we have a backup data inside here. So we can have also uh, uh, a replication strategy to improve availability of our system, right? But the punchline that I wanted to say uh, just to avoid a single point failure is that the case db um we're gonna shut the data so that we ensure that we have much more efficient um uh, like cache database because of if we didn't have like different nodes during the user's database we were not going to be able to handle like 300k updates a second this is going to be quite intense for a single server to handle right so having these different servers Essentially, you can think of it as like we are evenly distributing that load to different servers, right? It's because of the data is stored on different nodes. So this is good. And we also spoke about that application strategy in which for each node, we're going to replicate that data into like a secondary data. So this is to ensure that if this goes down, we know that we have data stored on like a secondary node. Now let's try to understand how we're going to actually be able to scale the PubSub server. So we said that the PubSub server is nothing, but it's whereby the users can actually uh, publish their current location and that location will be broadcasted to the subscribers. The subscribers in this case are going to be their nearby friend, right? So before we think about scaling the PubSub servers, we need to understand essentially the CPU as well as the memory load. Uh, this is going to be quite important so that we can understand how many pops up servers do we actually need. So starting with the memory, we do know that, okay, the Redis pops up is going to maintain the hash map, um, which is going to represent the channels and it's going to maintain the hash map as well as a linked list um, data structure, right? So we can assume that this is going to take a 20 byte, um, a 20 byte pointer. Right. So given that each user on average, this is just an assumption assumption. So given that each user has like hundred friends, so what we can do is that we can multiply this hundred friend by hundred million because if we said that hundred million is going to become uh the active users, um the users or not the active user, I think the active users we said that it was 10 million, but we said that hundred million is gonna be the users that are using the, their nearby friend. So the reason I'm choosing 100 million is because of we have to also consider the users who are offline because we have to create the channels for them. So that's why we're using 100 million, 100 million not 10 million, okay? Um, then we're gonna multiply this by this 20 byte because we're trying to understand the memory overhead of this. So this is gonna give us approximately 200 uh, GB, right? So Assuming that a single Redis server can be able to take 100 gig, so that means that we're going to need two um, Redis server. So this is going to represent our, 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 our memory. So we need two Redis server. Now coming to the CPU, I don't know if you can still remember, but one thing that we did say, we said that, okay, we're going to be making 14 million updates, right? 
So we're going to be making 14 million updates a second. And we did actually mention that this is an overkill. This is quite a lot for us to manage, right? So let's assume that a single Redis, a single Redis instance can actually be able to make uh, 100K uh, updates, right? 100K updates, um, 100K updates a second. So which means that how many how many Redis server do we go are we going to need? So 14 million is gonna be divided by 100k. So we're gonna need over like 140k servers of Redis instance, right? So what does this tell us? It tells us that um, the CPU, the computation is the bottleneck, right? The computation is the bottleneck. <clears throat> so that's what we're gonna to have to take care of. Now that we have 140k Redis instance of service, how are we going to then um, distribute these channels uh, across those number of servers, right? We have these channels that have to be have to be distributed across the Redis pub sub server cluster. So the good news is that these channels are independent, right? So a channel can does not have to depend on other channels, right? So we can shut these channels across these 140k uh, servers so the question is how are we then going to do that so because if we know that what we need to do is that we need to know let's say we get we have a channel name we need to know which server is this channel name going to be if that makes sense so let me rephrase this again so we have like multiple servers and we want to uh, evenly distribute the channels across these servers. But when a user wants to publish a message, we have to know which servers has a specific channel uh, aligned to that user, right? Remember that we said that each user has a channel, but how will we know that this server has a channel? So let's make an example so that you can actually be able to understand. So we said that, okay, we can imagine that this is our Redis cluster. Uh, a cluster is just a group of node, right, servers. So we can have all of these servers here, right? Um, we can have all of these servers. Let's assume that channel two is within this server, right? So how are we going to know that, okay, channel two is within this server, right? Because of there's a lot of channels inside here because they're evenly distributed across these servers. So this is where the concept of consistent hashing is gonna come into play, consistent hashing. So the idea here is that we essentially going to have all of these servers on this hash ring, then when we have a channel name, we're going to hash that channel name, right? We're going to hash that channel name, then this will tell us where does this lie, right? Let's say it lies here. So that means that server one, so we're assuming that this is a server name, server one is responsible for this channel two. So now, which means that the WebSocket server that we spoke about, right? The WebSocket server, the first thing that we'll do is that when the user want to publish uh, their current location, the WebSocket server say, okay, I want to know where should I where is your channel because I want to store that current location. So it's gonna to go to the consistent hash to say, please hash this channel name of the user. I want to know their server. Then the consistent hash is gonna tell the this WebSocket that okay, it's actually stored. Uh, you can find the channel of this user on server one. Then the WebSocket will go to server one. It will find the channel. Then it will publish that will publish that location update, right? Then the broadcasting stuff will take over. But this is the idea, right? Uh, I'm gonna cover consistent hashing in the second video, whereby we're gonna talk about how we design um, the system considering a consistent hashing. So if you don't still don't get how this works, but uh, trust me, we're gonna cover that in the its own system. So there can be a lot of edge cases as well as scenarios that we actually need to take care of, right? Um, one example might be, uh, what if a user has like many friends, right? So 
how do we handle that? So I wanna say that I think on Facebook, uh, there's a cap uh, of friends that you can have, which is 5,000. So we shouldn't be thinking about the system from a follower uh, perspective, whereby a celebrity can have like millions of followers. So if this was the case, then you can imagine that essentially we were going to have to update the current location for like millions of users, right? So having a cap will actually help us a lot because we only have to take care, uh, only consider that, okay, the user will have like this amount of, of friends, right? So there's quite a lot of edge cases that one can come up with, uh, but I'm not going to get into them because this video is already too long. Um, I'll leave a link for, to the textbook uh, if you want to like uh, dive deeper, but I feel like we have covered quite a lot. Um, but with that said, I thank you guys for watching to the end. I'll see you guys in the next one.